Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Australian Human Rights Commission's KEP Enderby Memorial Lecture. My name is Laurie Lawira, and I'm a senior producer and reporter for SBS World News. For those who are visually impaired and blind joining us today, um, I'm of Asian background, of Asian appearance. Um, I have a physical disability. I have six fingers um, and I have a limb difference. Um, I'll be guiding us through today's event. Uh, the KIPP Enderby Memorial Lecture is an annual public event held by the Australian Human Rights Commission to honour the memory of the Honourable Kep Enderby QC. As Attorney General, Kep Enderby introduced into Parliament the bill which would become Australia's first anti-discrimination and human rights legislation, that is the Racial Discrimination Act of 1975. Each year, the Memorial Lecture advances public understanding and debate about racism and human rights. Uh, first, some housekeeping. Well, today's event is in the form of a webinar. webinar. This means audience members will be muted and your cameras will be turned off. Auslan interpretation will be available on screen and you can turn on closed captions by clicking on the closed captions button on your viewer. In your reminder emails for today's event, you will have also received a document with instructions on how to access closed captions. If you experience any technical difficulties, we recommend you leave the webinar, then rejoin. A recording of this webinar will also be uploaded to the Commission's YouTube channel in the next few days. So once again, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, it'll be a wonderful event. Um, I'd like to invite, first of all, Raymond Bubbly Wetherill, a cultural representative of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, to welcome us here today. Raymond is a Gomeroy man from Northwest New South Wales, an activist, social justice advocate, and land defender. He comes from a line of healer, line of healers, and has a unique ability to use culture for strength-based healing to overcome lost barriers and the effects of intergeneration and transgenerational trauma. He is a knowledge holder of Aboriginal law, culture, and heritage. Bubbly strives to strengthen knowledge and life through cultural learning and understanding to assist and empower people and community. The fight for equality, justice, human rights, land protection, and our children is a long one, but Bubbly perseveres, hoping to instill a pride in culture, language, and protection of heritage that his children will continue. Bubbly, it's honor, it's a great honor to have you with us today. Take it away. Um, thank you, Laurie. Um, first and foremost, I always, I'd like to give people a bit of an understanding and a bit of history about myself, because obviously we've taken different pathways to meet here today. Obviously, it's on a Zoom and not in the physical presence, but I'll still share the same message that I always do with good spirit. Yaman Ginda Gamilare winning Bulda. Nadi Gua Birja Gunaganu Kabin Gunagul Gamilare. You are a Yimba Mora Wari. You know, my parents made a very conscious decision back in 1971 to bring me and my three siblings at the time to Warang or Sydney for an education. Now, if you can imagine the primary school and the high school being in the same building, that is the infrastructure that is Collar Enterprise still today. You know, um, that's mainly agribusiness there. So I sort of went through school and um, I, moved, I lived on Gadigal. Then we moved to Wangal, Betty Eagle, Earlwood. And for the past 13 years, I've I've lived on Thurwell speaking lands out at uh, Campbelltown. You know, um, I finished my HSC back in 1988. Um, I sort of went into a job with Social Security, Centrelink at the time, it was, uh, Social Security, but Centrelink now it is. Sort of wasn't for me after going to school for that long. I went back to the bush actually and spent six months of the year doing the harvest. I like working with my hands and sort of I did a lot of plumbers labouring where, you know, um, sort of it was manual labour, but the shadiest weather you could get was down in a trench digging six foot down, you know, in 40 to 45 degree heat up home as it always is and... I sort of came to a, a crux, let's say, in my life, probably about 13 years ago where I met my wife, you know, and she fell pregnant and I knew that I needed a career, not a job, you know, and it was sort of, I went back to the Education Centre Against Violence at Westmead and um, I acquired a 
and advanced diploma in trauma counselling. Aboriginal people carry trauma. You know, it's in their DNA for six generations. It's been proven, you know, and I feel it's my obligation to heal the land but also heal the people that are on it, you know, and obviously I'm here on behalf of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council today and I'm on I'm on Gadigal land and, you know, um, Gadigal is only one of 29 clan groups, you know, where they live the symbiotic lifestyle with each other and everything within their boundaries. You know, and the Gumarai, my people, we had very strong ties here with the Gumaragal, Gweagal, you know, Boromadigal, Darak, out further west in Sydney, you know, and it's sort of through those revitalised songlines and relationships that I sort of reached out to Metro probably 18 months ago because I wanted to do smoking ceremonies. You know, I did them as a part of my work where smoking a person, smoking their space uh, with good energy and good spirit, and that was the first part of assisting them on their healing journey. You know, and... I sort of started to do that because I figured it was different spaces, you know, where I could go, you know, so that I could do it. And then I sort of ventured into this part of it as well as being a rep so that I could talk to different people and just sort of say a few things that may resonate in regards to the Aboriginal experience, you know, on Gadigal or across, you know, the 350 nations, 500 language groups on this continent, you know. So on behalf of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, you know, I'd, I'd like to welcome you to Gadigal on behalf of their board, their members, you know, and I hope you all have a wonderful day and um, yeah, well, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to come and do it today. So thank you. Well, thank you, Raymond, for that warm and generous welcome and also sharing a bit of your personal life story with us. Um, well, the Commission would like to um, recognise the strength, hope and courage of those who tirelessly undertake anti-racism work and build visions of change. In particular, the Commission recognises First Nations communities who have been at the forefront of anti-racist action for hundreds of years. Our event partner today is the European Union Delegation to Australia. For the last 40 years, the Delegation to Australia has been actively strengthening the bilateral ties between the EU and Australia. I'd like to introduce European Union Ambassador to Australia, his Excellency, Mr. Gabriella Vizentine. Prior to his arrival in Australia in 2022, Mr. Vizentine was the EU Special Envoy for the Indo-Pacific and previously served as head of the Parliamentary Affairs Division in the European External Action Service for several years. His focus is publicizing the main strands of the EU strategy for the Indo-Pacific, creating consensus and paving the way for its implementation. I'd like to invite you, Ambassador, and welcome you to today's event. Thank you very much, Laurie, uh, and thanks to, to all the attendees today. And, uh, and uh, congratulations for organizing this, this great event today. And, uh, and uh, although I never made it big in sports, I, was, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I enjoyed really uh, uh, sports, uh, notably tennis, and rugby and football, and, uh, and uh, it's an incredible vehicle for a mutual understanding and, and integration. And, uh, and uh, thank you for organizing this because it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very powerful message also to the young generations. So uh, good afternoon to all and welcome. Uh, uh, if you allow me also, I would like to welcome you to this Cap Enderby Memorial Lecture for 2023. As you said, Laurie, uh, uh, the European Union has strong bonds with, with this lecture, and we are really proud to support it uh, year after year, and we will continue to do so. So uh, before I begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we all live and pay respect to their elders past, present, and emerging. And as I said, I would really like to thank the Australian Human Rights Commission for organizing this event and for the incredibly fruitful and, and, and great partnership that we are enjoying uh, uh, in, through the years. So in both Europe and Australia, we know how sport is more than just supporting your team or going to the field to kick around the ball. Sport goes beyond this because it, it is entwined with our very culture. It is essential to our pursuit of excellence and our ability to respect each other. And this is a unifying element in both Australia and European societies and cultures. 
from a small child practicing their tennis serve so they can hit the ball to elite athletes training to be the next winner of the Australian Open, we see individuals learn how to persevere and grow. We watch and admire as opponents come together and shake hands, showing how we can respect each other because that is the pursuit of humanity. This is why sport can play such an intrinsic role for us in breaking down barriers, because in the pursuit of excellence and respect, we no longer see things that we are told divide us. Race, gender, religion, or sexual preference play no concrete role in which team won the World Cup. Instead, sport brings people and even nations together. In Australia, for example, sport has been at the forefront of breaking down the barriers around indigenous affairs. Looking at Australia's famous sporting stars, you note that a, that a significant number of them are indigenous. Imagine if the trailblazing uh, Vera Dury woman, Yvonne Gulagong Coley, was not invited to learn to play when she peered through the fence at her local courts because of her race. Would an indigenous Australian woman have then won Wimbledon or another 13 Grand Slam titles? Would there have been such acceptance for indigenous athletes in Australia? What would that have meant for champions like Cathy Freeman or Ash Barty, for example? However, sport is not just a pathway for diverse groups to succeed. It also has a role in holding those who wish to spread hatred and vision to account. Like Jesse Owens standing on a podium at the 1936 Olympics in Nazi Germany, or Australian Olympic diver, Matthew Mitchum, who bravely confronted prejudice and he came out ahead of the 2008 Olympics. Sport can shine a light onto darkness and prejudice that hold society back. In the EU, we work tirelessly to build a society that holds to the values of human dignity, freedom, equality, and solidarity. And this is because we have found that sport is a fundamental pathway to building the communities we want. Ones that are cohesive, inclusive, and embrace diversity, whatever diversity means. And it provides us with a framework to live freely. And if you allow me, after all, Olympics were born in Europe, Greece, more than 2,000 years ago. So the, the spirit is European. <laughs> Marginalized and underprivileged groups through sport have the opportunity to interact and integrate with other groups, thereby enabling the majority to see others for their merits only. And further, individuals living with a disability have the opportunity to display their worthiness through sports with the success of events like the Paralympics, highlighting that when we challenge stereotypes, we can forge a society that is stronger and safer for all. And I am sure that Brisbane 2032 will be an incredible success in this respect. If our society's behavior is shaped by experiences, then Events like this today and the consistent work conducted by the Australian Human Rights Committee have a unique role in moving the world towards a place where we all are equal. And I hope that of the nearly, I see 1000 participants who have joined today, will enjoy the transformative dialogue that we in the EU and the Australian Human Rights Commission believe will usher in a powerful commitment to anti-racism in Australia, in the EU, worldwide, also through sport. And I thank you very much for having me today and for your attention. Well, thank you, Ambassador Byzantine, for your opening remarks and reflections that you mentioned some very um, high profile pioneering Australian athletes um, and also what you mentioned about the power of sports. So thank you for those remarks and thank you for the partnership with the KEP Enderby Memorial Lecture. 
Well, we really will now... my pleasure and we will continue. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you, Ambassador. We will now hear from the President of the Australian Human Rights Commission and Acting Race Discrimination Commissioner, Rosalind Croucher. Rosalind commenced her seven year term as Commission President on the 30th of July, 2017. Prior to joining the Commission, uh, Rosalind was President of the Australian Law Reform Commission, where she led a number of significant law reform inquiries. I'll hand over now to President Croucher, uh, who'll speak to you. Thank you, Laurie, very much for your warm introduction. And thank you, Your Excellency, for your wonderful opening remarks. And of course, thank you to Raymond Wetherill for his fabulous welcome to country. And before I begin, I would also like to add my acknowledgement of country on Gadigal land where I am now for the traditional custodians who've looked after this place so well and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and to acknowledge any indigenous participants in our webinar today. I am both honored and delighted to welcome you to the 2023 Kep Enderby Memorial Lecture. And I extend my warmest greetings to each one of you. As president of the Australian Human Rights Commission and acting race discrimination commissioner, it is my great privilege to introduce this discussion on racism in sport. This event could not have come at a more critical juncture in our history. Throughout 2023, the pervasiveness of racism in the Australian sporting sector has been revealed. It has brought to the forefront the importance of the very principles and values that the Commission was founded on. And it aligns with our ongoing commitment to safeguarding the rights and dignity of every individual, every human being, regardless of their background or beliefs. In this year, the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, affirming this commitment is more important than ever. In 2006, the Commission released the seminal report, What's the Score?, which laid the groundwork for our involvement in addressing racism in sport. Over the years, we have continued to deepen our understanding, adapting to the changing landscape. Having convened round tables with sporting sector experts, we redefined our advocacy on this topic to address racism at the institutional and systemic levels. Our more recent production of the Spectator Racism Guidelines in 2021 reflects this. Today we gather to discuss not only the progress we have made, but also the road ahead. We will explore the profound impact of the Women's World Cup, an event that transcended the boundaries of sport to challenge sex discrimination, racial discrimination, and LGBTQIA plus discrimination. But this lecture is not just about analysis and assessment. It is a call to action. It is an invitation to all of us to examine our roles in creating a more inclusive sporting world. It is an opportunity to collaborate, to learn, and to innovate in our collective efforts to tackle racism. The power of conversation and education should not be underestimated. Our dialogue today has the potential to ripple far beyond this virtual room, extending its influence into arenas, stadiums and communities. It is through conversations like these that we can redefine the narrative, remove barriers and build a sporting world where diversity is celebrated and racism is an artifact of the past. 
I want to express my profound gratitude to all our esteemed speakers, experts, and advocates who have dedicated their time to share their insights and wisdom with us. I also extend my thanks to all of you who have chosen to be here today. For your presence underscores the significance of this issue and your commitment to anti-racism. Let us approach this lecture with open hearts and open minds. Let us listen, engage, and reflect. Together, we can drive positive change and work towards a sporting landscape where discrimination and racism have no place. Thank you for joining us on this journey towards a more inclusive and just future. Without further ado, I invite you to embrace the discussions and ideas that will shape our shared path forward. Together, let us pave the way for a more equitable and inclusive world, both on and off the field. Thank you. Many thanks, President Croucher, for your contribution today, really setting out the importance of this moment and giving us that rallying cry. Uh, yes, it's, uh, it's really inspiring us to, to embrace what we're going to do today and obviously take this further. So thank you very much for that. And thank you for leading the important work of the Commission. Well, today's oration is from Ellen Van Nieven. It's an opportunity to learn and to think critically about how sport can play in negotiating the necessary space for anti-racism. Ellen is a award-winning writer of Mananjali and Dutch heritage. They write fiction, poetry, plays, and nonfiction. Their latest book, Personal Score, Sport, Culture, Identity, is a groundbreaking book that raises important questions about the relationships between race, gender, identity, and playing sport on stolen sovereign land. Now, bear with me because Ellen has won a number of awards. Uh, Ellen has won the David Unipon Award, the Dobby Literary Award, the New South Wales Premier's Literary Awards Indigenous Writers Prize, the Kenneth Slesser Prize for Poetry, the Multicultural New South Wales Award, and Book of the Year in the New South Wales Premier's Literary Awards. And that is among others. It's a privilege to have you with us today, Ellen, and we look forward to what you are saying uh, in your speech, in your uh, presentation today. Over to you. Thank you so much. I am here in gratitude and honor, and I'm honored to be sharing this oration with you from the place I am on, which is Ngunnawal and Ngambri country in Canberra. And I pay my greatest respects to the traditional owners and elders of this place. I have Mananjali and Dutch ancestry. My mother's family belonged to Black Soil Country between the Logan and Albert Rivers in Southeast Queensland. My brother and I grew up on Yagara and Turrbal land, north of Mianjin, kicking a ball in the backyard and flicking pages of books from sunrise to sunset. Sport is a compelling force in Australian lives. At its best, it's deeply euphoric, joyful, community binding, morale boosting, and good for our mental, physical, spiritual, and social health. Yet deeply ingrained in contemporary Australian sporting culture is exploitation, extraction, and abuse. It is 2023 and we haven't managed to stamp out racism in sport, and we are not even close to doing so. This racism reflects societal attitudes, yet we should not accept racism as part of our sporting culture. 
there is absolutely no room for racism across all levels, including elite sport, community sport, and school sport. And any anti-racist stance in Australian sport must also be intersectional and support the right for people of all backgrounds, religions, abilities, genders, and sexualities to play. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land is attributed to Uncle Jim Bates' explanation in the 80s of his unbroken connection to Barkindji country. On this continent, the football field, the race track, the sporting ground, the public park, the swimming pool, the local beach, the gym, anywhere we train, play and exercise is unceded Indigenous land. And deeply ingrained in the land is culture. Country comes first. We exist on a continuum where sport has always been here and always will be, just as we as First Nations peoples have always been here. Growing up in Queensland as a young, queer Murray person obsessed with sport and a keen writer. I never thought one day I could write a book about sport and have it published. I saw that the authors, historians and authorised experts of sport were largely white straight men endorsed by white Australia. But we are all authors, experts, and historians in our own right. And there are many sports stories from this continent that go largely untold. Who claims sport? Who owns sport? The sports that define us as a nation are deeply tied to a whitewashing of history. Before AFL, there was Mangrook. And before football, there was Wogabiliri. Mangrook is a collective name for the spectacular Indigenous kicking game played widely across Southeast Queensland and Central Australia. Sorry, Southeast and Central Australia. And Wogabiliri is a collective name for a traditional round ball kicking game mentioned in John Maynard's Aboriginal Soccer Tribe. The collective name has Wiradjuri and Ngunnawal origins. So this is a game that comes from the place where I'm on today. Other indigenous games include Weme, a stone bowling game played on Aranda country in the central desert. These are just a few of the hundreds of games played on this continent for thousands of years before the arrival of settlers. Indigenous games do not have borders, boundaries or lines, instead working with the natural shape of country and actively respecting and looking after country. The full list of recorded First Nations sports and games which can be accessed via the Australian Sporting Commission website, is extensive and expansive. So already, this complicates the idea that Europeans brought sport here and there was no sport before their arrival. There is a history here of a game being stolen and changed and some of us have been denied our traditional sporting heritage as part of an attempted genocide against our peoples. In an international parallel to AFL, did you know that basketball has its origins in Native American culture? And American settlers took basketball from Native Americans, just as Canadian settlers took lacrosse and ice hockey 
from Indigenous Canadians. These sports then become coded in ideas of national pride and culture without recognition of their Indigenous origins. Cultural theft and tactics of deceit and dishonesty ensure that the occupation exists not just in the land, but also in the settler imaginary. Sport is a powerful ideology through which we tell ourselves what is and what isn't Australian. Our national culture is tied up with sports such as cricket and swimming, sports that at an elite level do not reflect the diversity of our communities. The first Australian cricket team, well, it consisted of all Aboriginal players from Victoria who went to England on a tour in 1868 in an era where international sporting matches were extremely rare. The origin of the Australian crawl, commonly known as freestyle, a young Solomon Islander by the name of Alec Wickman, living in Sydney, who was spotted swimming a version of the stroke popular in his home island by two brothers who then modified their swimming stroke using this as, imagine, as inspiration. And this became known as the Australian crawl. That is the colonial project to accumulate, to appropriate, yet to deny others their existence, humanity, and agency. In my book, Personal Score, I research and write how the places where we play sport, many of the ovals and sporting grounds in use today, were already cleared of trees and other vegetation by mob for ceremony before colonization. When sport became a land grab, Colonial Australia inserted sacredness into places that were already sacred, claiming them while also trying to erase that history. When we see sport as sacred to modern Australia, I ask myself, whose sacred are you talking about? Most of my research on sporting grounds took place in Southeast Queensland, but I would say it's indicative of the rest of the continent. These places were deliberately cleared for mob to have ceremony and are really sacred, holding very old traditions of storytelling and community building, and were also sites of sport and play. And then the same places were conveniently chosen to be some of the early colonial sporting grounds. And they continue as sports grounds to this day. The horror and the pain we feel keenly in our hearts comes from our mob being taken from these places and the attempted genocide. It comes from country no longer belonging with us, but being owned by the council, the government, a sporting club. But in some ways, even though there's that pain there's also a slight comfort because I have fond memories of playing on some of those grounds where my mob sang and danced and kicked a ball since the first sunrise and a feeling really connected to those places through my body and spirit. I feel the continuation of what's been enacted there before. But also, of course, I have a real understanding that to truly decolonize sport is to say, give the land back. The sporting traditions that Australia is so attached to, whether it's Melbourne Cup or the Boxing Day Test, they are so new and so young compared to a much older tradition of playing and being on country. Sweat is how country recognizes us. We offer our sweat to let the ancestors know who we are and what our intentions are for being on the place at a particular time. So playing sport is an embodied act on Indigenous land, 
it is ceremony. A pitch marked with lines is laid on top of a site that had no lines. There remains a firm injustice that Indigenous people experience racism and discrimination while on Indigenous land playing sports that have Indigenous origins. Western ideas of sport, especially the disassociation from physical place, are deeply linked to the climate crisis and climate denial. Play and culture and sport mean and have meant connection to mob. Traditional sports are part of learning about and provided experiences of respecting and looking after country. Dear ancestors, does the word sport even work when we apply it to how we played on country before colonization? Settler assumptions of sport are about conjuring territory or winning against other people rather than custodianship and connection. With sport aiding climate denialism, with tournaments played in summers that are gonna be hotter and hotter, will we have air conditioned stadiums? Sport becomes even further removed from being connected to place. And because of the climate change we're experiencing, a lot of sports and games that we all enjoy, particularly indigenous people, who as the UN says, have the smallest ecological footprints, but shoulder the heaviest burden when it comes to climate change, are being threatened. In my book, I mention Uncle Sterling Maguire, the groundskeeper of Narimbria Magpies Football Club in Rockhampton, a role that keeps him involved in a sport that he's loved all his life and connects him to his ancestral Durrambul country. This club has been literally washed away several times due to the increase of flooding from extreme weather events like cyclones in central and north Queensland. The footsteps and the track marks of a long continuance of playing on country are fading, are disappearing, are drowning. There is something about sport, its heightened attention to the body that makes it a site where racial hate exists on a visceral level and with a certain intensity. It is 2014. A 14 year old Aboriginal girl from North Queensland is playing her first representative tournament in netball, a sport loved amongst Indigenous players, but one where in 100 years only two Indigenous women have worn the green and gold. In the changing room, racist remarks disguised as jokes about her skin, hair, and general appearance contribute negatively to her body image and she stops playing netball. A more silent and persuasive way racism operates in sport is imposing white gendered beauty standards, particularly on our young people. It is 2019, a 14 year old boy of Sudanese heritage plays football in Western Sydney amongst a sea of verbal racial abuse by adult spectators. His team loses the match and he is upset. He wants to have a word to the main perpetrator in the crowd after the match, but he is quickly blocked by his teammates who are worried he'll react with physical violence though he has no intention of doing so. Racism does not deter him from playing, but it means that after every match, his stomach is in knots and he feels like crying. Due to the skewed ways in which non-white people are othered 
victims, survivors of racist hate speech are often themselves seen as the aggressors and told they are angry or overreacting in order to invalidate their experiences. It is 2021. A 14-year-old Aboriginal boy is playing a rugby match in a regional town in New South Wales. It is alleged that the boy was subject to repeated racial slurs during the match by the opposing team. The emotional toll this took resulted in the boy collapsing in his sister's arms after the match. When the boy and his mother made a complaint, the other team denied any racial abuse had occurred. While on-field vilification at the elite level is often condoned, as players are increasingly making a stand when they hear it from the general public or, or the opposing team, racism in community sport goes largely unchecked. It is 2004. I am also 14. I'm playing football at my local high school. Over a long sustained period, a select group of my peers frequently call out racial slurs whenever I touch the ball. As far as I can see, no teachers or students do anything to try and stop it. This type of vilification was so commonplace in the environments that I grew up in that it was far from newsworthy. Unfortunately, it mirrors what many of my relatives also experienced. Other people constantly remind you of your race, your gender, of whether you belong in their eyes. This made me feel utterly worthless and hopeless about changing the attitudes of the people around me. For children and young people, racial bullying at, at school could be their most common experience of racism in sport. As a 14 year old, I would have hoped that 20 years later, our society would have changed. Sadly, it hasn't yet. A joyful and proud experience came many years later, playing at the National Indigenous Football Championships on Gubby Gubby land. From the Kuri Nookout to the African Nations Club, many of us gravitate to alternative sports spaces and tournaments as a way of feeling safe and being able to express our identity fully. Dear ancestors, please protect us in all the places we choose to play as our hearts are bruised and full of fear. Sport in Australia is seen as a sacred cow. You can't criticize the way that Australian sport is set up, it's out of bounds. There's this persisting idea that sport is apolitical, which is of course such a false dichotomy. Sport is absolutely used for politicians to sway votes and, and to sell authenticity. Sport is a soft power of empire. In an article in the Indigenous X I wrote earlier this year, I said, it's always ironic when people call to keep politics out of sport, when sport is inherently political and part of a world that continues to colonise, brutalise, and divide. The idea of sport being apolitical relates to a clean narrative of triumph and transcending any social circumstances. That sport is bestowed on people of marginalized backgrounds like it's a generous thing. We'll give you sport. Sport has given you so much. You should be so grateful. Whereas it's actually the reverse, as in Wiradjuri poet Janine Lane's poem about rugby league, Whitefellas, where Janine says, white people are happy to say that rugby league 
has done a lot for Aboriginal people. Even though Aboriginal people have done a lot for rugby league. The rugby league in this poem could be substituted by a number of sports. What would Australian sport be without our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander athletes? Without Adam Goods, without Kathy Freeman and many others. People hold onto sport so fiercely and are so defensive about issues like racism. They want to maintain sport as a sphere that's separate from the world. And they don't want their love for that pure thing to be questioned, challenged, or disrupted by off-field issues. Public discourse from politicians, sports people, and media pundits also tends to deny that racism exists or at least minimises the experience of victim survivors. While we remain force-fed the idea of a clean, sanitised sports narrative, like the style of a Netflix sports documentary, we look away from the real conflict and tension in sport that we must address. The historical racism and institutional racism that needs to be examined across the board is in every sport. That is the first step, acknowledging racism, and second is thinking through the impacts of racism, a truth-telling a listening to the voices of victims. What does racism do to an individual or community? It causes division, it activates trauma, it impacts on health, well-being, self-worth and agency. It excludes, it silences and it discriminates against individuals and communities. It disrupts and it distracts. On an episode of ABC's Q&A, Wiradjuri man Joe Williams, who played for the Rabbitohs, Panthers and Bulldogs, said incidences of vilification faced by players brought entire histories of persecution to the fore. It takes us directly back to years and decades of our mothers and fathers and grandparents being flogged and bashed just for being coloured, he said. Are players expected to just shrug it off? Let's look at the impact and effects of what racism is in alerting our stress response in our brain and everything that happens during that process of being targeted, racially vilified. Justice and accountability are crucial. Steeped in a culture of denialism and self-protection, often structures in sport defend perpetrators of racism instead of acting to support victims. Sporting institutions and organisations are reluctant to admit blame in historical racism and institutional racism as their roles are large and deep-seated. For example, how do we reckon with the co-founder of the AFL being involved in a massacre of around 370 Aboriginal people in Queensland in 1861, or the impact of systematic racism seated in a football club on players and their families? Larissa Baran and Lyndon Coombs the authors of the Do Better report commissioned by the Collingwood Football Club said that systematic racism doesn't mean that everyone in the club is racist, as some have tried to say. What it means is that the culture, structures and internal mechanisms aren't effective in, race, in facing racism, providing resolution and creating change. 
Dear ancestors, what is a way forward from here? How can we reckon with our shameful past and build a better future as a sporting nation? There is an ugliness beneath the surface that we can't shy away from. We do not need any more bystanders who stand and watch racism. We need upstanders to speak up and to act, to recognize what is wrong. We need leadership and the avenues for justice to transform a space that has been rotten for too long. Transformative justice is a political framework and approach for responding to violence, harm and abuse. In addition to increasing the cultural diversity within leadership and off-field roles, stadium bans and legal prosecutions for those found guilty of discriminatory behaviour in either a sporting venue or, or online, and potential points deductions for clubs, education reforms and transformative justice initiatives could also be put into effect where appropriate. These implementations may offer more expansive opportunities to support those harmed to heal and to move forward. A transformative justice initiative could be a truth-telling and justice process to recognize and address with meaningful and restorative action, historic and systemic racism. Transformative justice in the sports space could include a process where individuals affected by an injustice are given the opportunity to have their voices heard in a way which best suits them, with meaningful processes involved in addressing and repairing harm, education around where we learn racist and other oppressive behavior and thoughts, victim offender dialogues and healing circles within teams and communities. We could envision what sports looks like in a decolonial framework with an, with an embodied understanding of Indigenous land and instill these understandings in young people from an early age. We are not the only country in the world with a racism problem. No country has been able to successfully eliminate racism in sport. Imagine if we could show the world a way forward using Indigenous frameworks of respect for people and the land, connection, diversity, community, and inclusion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ellen. That was a, a very powerful oration and we're so very grateful for your time and complex analysis. Uh, undoubtedly, you've uh, given us many things to think about. Um, what I got out, particularly when you mentioned how sites are talked about as being sacred when they already were, I think that's a that's a real uh, powerful message when we go to venues now or when we play on those sporting fields. Um, also, like how structures protect perpetrators. That's a that's a good, uh, I guess, challenge for us to think differently about how um, our systems are set up. Um, and this one really struck with me was that how racism in community sports largely goes unchecked. Um, just from my own personal experience, I refereed rugby league or I referee rugby league and I've done so for, uh, for 20 years. 10 years ago, um, you know, in a pressure situation, I, I got heckled from someone in the crowd I'll, and it was a racist taunt. It was um, someone told me to get back on the boat or get back on my boat. And that was the one that stung. So. I really appreciate how you say that, you know, you do get on with it. So that was 10 years ago, but that's, the scars are still there. You still remember it. So uh, thank you for, for really articulating a lot of those personal, uh, you know, the, the personal encounters that a lot of us have had on the sporting field. And you also you say that you, you didn't know if you could write a book. I'm glad, so glad you have because uh, the, the book is fantastic. 
um, you really brought um, a lot of personal uh, stories to to a really wider issue that you're, you're obviously so passionate about. I I got from the book that you know, and this is something that really stuck with me was that um, the indigenous culture is not binary to sport. Sport and indigenous culture aren't binary. It's very much intrinsically linked. Um, so. Thank you for your comments. Um, I'm glad that you're going to stick around for our panel discussion, uh, which we're about to start and launch into now. Thank you. So we are pleased to bring you a panel discussion about racism in sport, and this aligns with decades of advocacy by the Commission, including the 2006 report, What's the Score?, and the more recent publication or pro production, sorry, of the Spectator Racism Guidelines in 2021. I want to brief you in, briefly introduce the panel members joining Ellen so that we can commence our discussion. They've all generously agreed to join us and share their observations, advocacy and expertise on racism in sport. Our first is Kaya Simon, an Anawin and Birupai woman and a Matildas player. She's also an ambassador for Reflect Forward, an anti-racism movement in the Australian sports industry, which encourages conversations between athletes, teachers, and students about racism in sport and society. Welcome, Kaya, to the event today. Karen Thanks, Far Laurie. Thanks for having me. Karen Farkerson is a professor of sociology and chair of the Anti-Racism Hallmark Research Initiative at the University of Melbourne, who researches in the sociology of race and racism with a focus on media and sport. So welcome, Professor Farkerson. And Melina Astana is the founder and executive director of Multicultural Women in Sport, an organization which aims to create pathways for the increased participation of women from multicultural backgrounds in sport for their empowerment, well-being, and sense of belonging. Welcome, Melina, today. Thank you. So I guess um, I'll throw open the discussion with a, an initial question that um, that Ellen sort of mentioned or touched on, and I'd like to get your thoughts on this. Um, what do you hear? What do you feel, or when you hear the phrase "sport and politics don't mix"? I might start with you first, Ellen. Yeah. Well, I think. As I mentioned in my talk, I think um, absolutely sport is in, inherently political. So it's it's not really something that you can separate. Um, keen to hear what the what everyone else thinks. How about you, Kaya? Yeah, as Ellen alluded um, to, um, sport is very political um, across all codes. It doesn't matter what code it is, um, whether it's community or professional, um, there is politics involved. So I find it um, quite contradicting um, that people say that athletes can't speak about sport or organisations can't make comments or political comments um, and should just focus on, on the sport. Um, I think there's a real stigma around athletes that we're vehicles and we should just go out there and play and keep our mouths shut and just do that, um, forgetting that we are human beings at the end of the day and we're in a position of positive influence and um, why should we be put in a box uh, and not allowed to speak about anything outside of the sporting field? I think we'd be missing a huge opportunity um, and instead of really enabling us to be able to raise our voices to bring the light to, to matters that are most important to the whole of society, I really think that um, it's just a narrow-minded way of, of thinking when that comment's thrown around. How about yourself, Karen? Sport is absolutely political um, and it's political globally. Um, South African government used sport as a vehicle for nation building after apartheid. Uh, explicitly, openly, it was exactly what they 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 planned to do. Um, Nikki Winmar lifting his jumper, a political act that actually did lead to some social change. I think that one of the challenging things for athletes speaking out is that oftentimes they get policed. And I'm thinking here of Adam Goods, um, Colin Kaepernick, um, and Nikki Winmar himself uh, criticized for um, for raising issues around the conditions around what they're experiencing. Um, 
that for sport is fully political and, and it's also political at the kind of micro level as well in the community sector who gets to play who gets to coach it's all politics and melina for you what do your what are your initial reactions when you hear sport and politics don't mix um, well, Ellen articula articulated this very well, and uh, I echo her words and, and also the words of the other panelists. We talk about sport washing now, and but with sport has always been used by, for centuries by countries to push their own agendas and uh, or assert supremacy. And uh, this is not a conundrum unique to just sport. It's something we discuss on each board table these days about you know, mixing sport, uh, mixing politics with law, mixing politics with other things. It's a difficult question to answer because what is political from one person, community or nation, may be a human rights issue for another. And human rights issues cannot be ignored even if couched in debates relating to free speech or issues of sovereignty. Personally, I believe that sports diplomacy has a powerful role in navigating geopolitical issues and creating people-to-people -people links. So, so it's always going to be, I think we cannot separate politics and sport. It's always going to be the case. So how do we navigate that is, is the question. So I guess given that sport has this, uh, it, it can be uh, a powerful tool to renegotiate our understandings of race and racism. In your view, how has the uh, recent Women's World Cup driven a new momentum and created space for discussion and action? And how can we best leverage this? I guess to you, Kaya, you are very much involved in the tournament from a player's point of view. Um, what about you? What are your personal insights in how uh, one the event went and what else it could provide and what potential is there to take away from the, the World Cup? Yeah, look, I mean, it's no secret how amazing the most recent World Cup was um, to be a female athlete who's been in the Matildas for the last 15 years. Uh, it's a tournament that I never imagined would happen in my career uh, span, but definitely not here on our own home, home shores. And to see the country come together um, and support us through our journey, for us to take them on the emotional roller coaster with us, um, I've never witnessed um, to that uh, extent uh, people showing up for a female sporting event here in Australia. And, and for me, that made me really proud. Um, and I think also on a personal level, for me being an Indigenous gay female athlete, um, to be a part of, you know, a sporting event like the FIFA Women's World Cup here in Australia, um, like I said, it captured the hearts of the nation, um, inspired so many young girls and also young boys who are saying to their mum and dad, I want to be a Matilda one day. And I think that's so incredible and so powerful within itself. And I think that shows the power of sport, the impact we can have on our nation, on generations to come, on future generations as well. Um, and that's not just for our, our you know, young whippersnappers, that's um, up until our elders as well. And um, I think we can't let that momentum get away from us. Um, I think there's a real opportunity to leverage what we've done recently here on our home shores. Um, and that if that's in the form of championing us as female athletes to empower other females to speak up, to have self-belief and to stand up for things that they truly believe in. Um, and it's just a matter of magnifying that voice um, and enabling us to be able to confidently go out there in front of the cameras, in front of, you know, public spaces and arenas and be able to say, you know, I'm a female footballer, but I'm also really passionate about this. And if it's anti-racism in sport, um, it's just a matter of nurturing and supporting um, our, our strong, empowering female athletes. Obviously, Kai, it was great to see the weekend, um, the, the Olympic qualifiers, still record crowds, um, great performance by the Matildas. We do love winners, I guess. So I think that um, th th this is a great moment for to get these issues out, uh, would, would you say? Yeah, definitely. Look, I think there's um, no greater time and no, I guess there's so many eyes on female sport right now, on the power of female sport. Um, I guess us being involved, you know, I guess the, the loyal fans that have been there from the get-go um, and knew that female sport was 
a great product and brand. And I think we as players always knew that, but we never had the attention, the recognition, the light, um, the ability to be able to do it as a full-time job. Um, I said in an interview the other week um, around the launch of the A-League here in Australia that I played in my first professional contract here in the A-League for free. Um, and we all did that across the board. And you see a product now where we can actually have a full-time job in being a professional athlete. We're getting paid um, to, to be able to be full-time in our sport. Um, and I th think it's on the, the right way and it's heading in the right direction. But again, it's just a matter of um, really magnifying that and creating so many opportunities and inspiring the next generation. We wouldn't be in the position as Matildas now if it weren't for the players before us. And I think people, it's easy to forget that and people, a lot of people say Matildas were an overnight success, but there were so many pioneers before us and the current team that did their part to get us to the point of being able to really enjoy what it is to be a Matilda and be a female professional athlete these days. Well, Melina, your work in multicultural women in sport um, really uses sport uh, to, to try and get a better sense of empowerment, well-being, sense of belonging, inclusion, what do you make of uh, the recent success of the Matildas and what happened in the World Women's World Cup and where to from here? It was such a historical moment in, in, in time for sport, I think, for women's sport. I was involved uh, in the FIFA Women's World Cup in a very different way than Kai. I'm definitely not a player. Um, um, I was involved in the human rights impact assessment for the FIFA Women's World Cup, and I was um, consulted by the Australian Human Rights Commission on that. Um, and the assessment was aimed to identify jointly with relevant national and international stakeholders the human rights risks and opportunities associated with the FIFA Women's World Cup and to make uh, recommendations for prevention and response. I also sp spoke at a sustainability panel. So for me, that aspect of the World Cup really sort of uh, was important. Um, it was conducted using the framework outlined in the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, an authoritative global standard for addressing and preventing human rights and impacts associated with business activity. So a lot of the activations you would have seen around the World Cup uh, were really came out through the human rights impact assessment. And I think that really created an impact in sort of changing, shifting the narrative of sport uh, and racism in sport to human rights, uh, the, the uh, a narrative that is now sort of more human rights centric. So um, there were so many different initiatives and uh, fans were encouraged to participate as well by kicking off conversations on human rights with families, friends and co colleagues. Uh, you, if you see something, say something. Uh, the uh, the uh, women's uh, the World Cup was also accepting human rights complaints face to face via email and online. So for me, these things are really important. All these actions are important catalysts in shifting our thinking about race and racism. Um, and we need to build on this nar narrative to leverage on the work that was done during the World Cup. I have personally tried to convince a number of other sporting organizations to conduct such assessments as a matter of practice, especially for mega sporting events. Um, and also sport has a unique ability to reach a broad audience and affect change. So when sport athletes or mega sporting events highlight issues of race and racial discrimination and take measures for remediation, it acts as a catalyst for institutional change in society generally as well. Uh, so the hope is that the World Cup not only created a momentum for women in sport, but has opened up difficult conversations about race through affirmative action, as well as encourage people to challenge their own biases and take a stand on these issues. Melina, I guess I'd like to sort of unpack a little bit of what you said. I'm just interested, did you anticipate sort of the reception that you got through the World Cup? Was it, was it how much was it helped by the success of the Matildas and actually being on Australian soil? Uh, being played and hosted by Australia? I think it, it was probably not. An, we obviously know every World Cup really, you know, creates a, a lot of, uh, you know, it, it's visible. It's one of the, you know, most widely played sport. But seeing it in Australia, seeing the crowd, seeing the passion, seeing little boys and girls so passionately cheering for the Matildas. I mean, I have never seen a sea of scarves of Matildas, caps, scarves, anywhere ever. And, and or any for, in fact, for um, any of the sporting events, it was just sort of so uh, 
it was brilliant. It was just this atmosphere that was created and it brought people together as well. For me, really, uh, sport is about bringing people together and that's and understanding each other, creating cultural uh, awareness. And that this World Cup really did that as well. So when you were part of the crowd, you just you were cheering for other teams as well. You, you're not from that country or, you know, you don't necessarily barrack for that, but you were cheering and you were got into the moment was you see shows of affection of support on the field and off the field that was really brilliant well for many sport can be both a form of resistance and empowerment and we heard these themes through ellen's oration Um, but karen i might just bring you into this conversation Uh, sport allows people to connect with one another and build communities Um, however there's a resistance to confronting racism in all areas of public life including sport in your work, um, what have you encountered and why do you think this is? So um, I think sport can be really great. It can build community. It's good for health. It can be good for mental health, but not if you're experiencing racism in it. So I like to challenge the narrative that sport's always good because the, the, um, the stories that Ellen shared of young people experiencing racism in, in sport, including themselves, um, that's not an inclusive environment. That doesn't make you feel good. Racism has been shown to have long-term health effects on people. It causes a thing called weathering, which actually ages you, makes you sick, makes you more prone to, to chronic disease. Um, it's really bad. And sport it, sport can mitigate that, but not if it's a space for racism. So I'll just say that. Why, why do we tolerate racism in sport? Like we know it's bad. Everyone's known it's bad for decades. Why do we, why do we tolerate it? We tolerate it because we want to. That's why we tolerate it. Um, we want to, we tolerate it because it maintains white supremacy. Um, uh, there's an interesting sociologist who quite a long time ago wrote about white men and the American sociologists being at the center of sport. So it, it's a gendered thing. It's heteronormative patriarchal whiteness that structures sport. Um, mainstream sport is structured around patri- heteronormative patriar- patriarchy. And it, it serves to maintain um, heteronormative patriarchal whiteness. Um, and so that's, that's, that's why we, I think that's why we continue to tolerate it. I'd say all types of racism in sport work in concert to reinforce the dominant uh, norm that white men should be at the center and run things and be in charge. Um, the racial vilification um, basically says that non-white people are not worthy of basic respect. Um, positional segregation, which is where um, non-white people play particular positions on the field, but also um, go into coaching and other post-playing opportunities, um, position that, that, that prevented prevented from that. That also serves to reinforce that um, patriarchal heteronormative whiteness in, in sport with the white man at the center. So, so why do we why do we tolerate it? Why why isn't it still why is it still there? Well, because it it serves the dominant power positions in society that are racialized. Um, that's what I think. Karen, if if I can ask a, a follow up question here, well, what do you think the role of say uh casual racism is and how there's particularly at the community level just this idea of just accepting it because it's a way to fit in um i think that the kids that are being and so i I did a a project a few years ago with some colleagues uh, um, that looked at how junior sports clubs manage diversity and we found in that project that racism was a feature of of participating across all five sports we looked at. Um, uh, so I think I think that casual racism, it, it actually normalizes the racial hierarchy in society. I think that kids get socialized into racism in a number of ways, including in sport. Um, uh, as Ellen said in, in their talk, that there's about um, uh, adult spectators harassing children. Um, if you, and, and your experience as well, Laurie, as being a, a non-white person who's being a, an official on the field also getting racially abused. Um, it, it, it really, the, the power dynamics um, are very problematic. Yes, they are. And I guess that leads us to the next question. Um, we witness structures that protect perpetrators of racism instead of functioning to support, say, the victims. What role can, um, and this question goes to you, Ellen, what role can truth telling and elevating the leadership of First Nations? and other negatively racialized people in the sporting sector play in this respect? 
Yeah, I spoke a, a little bit about truth telling processes earlier. Um, there are many truths that we need to hear and, and to honor as well. Um, we want people who are victim survivors of racism in sport to have a voice and to be supported through that process of truth telling. Um, stories are really important. It's how you know we we reach people. It's it's who we are as people. So I think you know storytelling, truth telling. Um, this will be a step forward for in both individuals and communities. And then the second part of the question around um, the uh, the leadership um, and elevating um, First Nations and First Nations people and people of color into roles where they can have a say in the future. Um, as Karen was really um, articulately saying, there's these invisible barriers that mean that people in the influential and powerful roles in sport are often white men. Um, and so it's important to both identify and remove those barriers. Well, Ellen, you, you mentioned, or you touched on it in your oration, that European conceptions of sport are strongly linked to the colonial project in Australia and have played a part in the creation of structurally inequitable society. So, Ellen, how can sport instead act as a vehicle for securing justice when it comes to gender, class and, and race? Yeah, these are all really, really great questions to be asking a poet. <laughs> I will clarify that I don't work in sport, um, but I have a really, you know, passionate um, interest in this, of course. And I think sport is one of the most influential spaces um, with the capacity to endorse diversity, inclusion and unity. Um, and we do live in this uh, structurally inequitable society which is not limited the, the inequalities are not limited to but include race gender class um, disability uh, where someone lives um, and sport is not an equal playing field in that not everyone has access to sport um, depending on their background so I would really like um, to see resource decisions based on equity and need um, to try and make sport as inclusive as possible because that that's what it always has been here on on this continent as sport has always been before colonization um, something that everyone can participate in so I'd like to to see that return Karen your your work is on um, providing a fair game for all that was one of your your papers um, can I bring you into this conversation and what are your thoughts? I think that sports, uh, I think it's I think it's a challenging space, to be honest, if you're looking thinking about sport as, as a vehicle for justice, I think it's a challenging space. Um, I think one of the challenges in the community sector in sport is it's all run by volunteers and volunteers are very stretched and uh, you have to have a champion to actually um, see change in a sports club. Um, because otherwise people will just, they're, they're really busy. They have their parents there or whatever. They, 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 they don't have the energy. Um, I think that professional sport and national sporting associations and the Australian Sports Commission actually could provide quite a bit of leadership along the lines that Ellen described around insisting that sport is an inclusive um, and, and non-homophobic, non, non non-sexist, non-racist space. Um, and they can do that there are some policy levers that could be um, could be used. I also feel that you know Australia is on the global stage, not that big of a country, and we should be trying stuff. You know, we should be mm -hmm. actually trying to be innovative and, and think about creative ways to to tackle racism. Um, I think that that there's opportunities there for us to be world leaders in this space, and but there has to be a political will. That that's a great point, uh, Karen. Rosalind at the start mentioned how that we should be, you know, a call to action, try to innovate. So I like that idea of innovating solutions. If I could stay with you on this question, Karen, like what would you say would be some practical anti-racism solutions that you've you may have come across, particularly at that ground roots, ground, sorry, grassroots and community level? Um, I think that, that the evidence base for what's effective is really lacking. Um, but I think that, again, we need to be trying stuff. Uh, for me, um, the number one priority would be looking at 
the complaints process as a way of managing racism. I think it's really not fit for purpose. Um, people who complain don't get any good any good outcomes. I think that there needs to be another collaborative approach to um, along the lines that, that Ellen talked about in their talk um, the, the, around truth telling, around transformative justice, around um, uh, you know, rather than the kind of punitive approach, I think it would be much better. Um, the kind of stuff that Kaya talked about for upstanders, uh, Kaya or Ellen, um, one of you talked about upstander, maybe it was Ellen, um, that, up, that being an upstander is actually uh, really, um, really important as well. Um, one of my colleagues is doing some work uh, on a project called Standing Together Against Racism in Sport. Karen Block is doing leading that work. Um, and it, it's really about how to teach people how to be upstanders when they encounter racism. I think one of the challenging things is when you encounter racism, you don't know what to do and it's shocking. Um, and I think having some guidance for people around how they can manage it, how, you know, to say something, um, if you feel safe to do so, um, call it out. Sometimes you're not safe, so you, you don't feel like you can call it out, but if you do feel safe to call it out, you should. Um, I think that's kind of the things that, that come to come to mind. Uh, Melina, you're obviously working in that space yourself as well. What what have you seen and what, what do you think should be the priorities? Uh, for me, the biggest thing is to shift the approach from just D and I or D E and I and whatever becomes fashionable to gloss over things and address the real issues of racism. We need to start looking at this from a human rights perspective. And um, also, as a, has been mentioned by other panelists, our leadership in sport is predominantly male Anglo-Saxon, so there is no incentive to change. Organizations, including sporting organizations, usually tick the box by appointing one person of a culturally diverse background, but then marginalize that person enough uh, for having a different viewpoint so that they are labeled as a troublemaker or pushed out of the system. It happens to me all the time in my own leadership positions, my, my, my authority is constantly challenged and undermined. Hence, nothing changes. The same applies to players as well as others in, um, in a minority in the sporting sector. So the, I think the real, real issue is we need to have more people in leadership positions. Um, I'm working from within to change those structures. I'm not sure, a, a lot of people might've heard about the Rooney rule where, uh, which originated in, um, in uh, rugby in, in the US where you're meant to, um, for any position that is opened up in, sporting, in, in the industry, you interview a person of a diverse background, BAME background, which is black ethnic minority background, um, without an obligation to actually employ them. That actually opens up the pool of people that are available and you actually do end up having a more diverse leadership. Um, we need to sort of start working on those kind of um, initiatives here in Australia as well. I was also involved in the Victoria University project that created a guide for action to encourage women of diverse, women of culture, encourage women from backgrounds, diverse backgrounds as leaders in sport. So that is another one which discuss, discuss barriers that women of diverse backgrounds face in sport, face in sport and how do we, um, you know, how can uh, sporting organizations uh, encourage women to become leaders, um, diverse women become leaders. I think also cultural diversity is treated as a separate issue. Um, we need to embed that in our strategy so that there's accountability. And I think Ellen mentioned that as well. We need accountability for, for actions as well. Unconscious bias training is really important as well as initiatives to create understanding, uh, create understanding about cultural differences as well as the similarities. And then cultural safety is really, really important. Creating safe spaces to share experiences without fear of being marginalized or ostracized. We need whistleblower protections uh, and, and implementation of some of the policies. There may be really good surface level policies uh, within sporting organizations, but where's the implementation? We don't really see uh, examples being set too often. Um, so it's important now because our demographic is important. Uh, demographic is diverse. We cannot pretend to be monochromatic because we are not. There's also greater awareness of these issues and more advocacy in this area. So I think all these um, uh, initiatives need to be implemented. Melina, you talk about a leader. We have a leader in our midst who's like, who's a great leader in our, uh, for many young girls and boys um, around the country. Kaya, you know, how you conduct yourself not only on the pitch and how you play, but your ability to overcome a lot of obstacles has been uh, very much a characteristic that's uh, synonymous with yourself. Um, and you've, of course, risen from community level sport to, to professionalism. Well, how do you think that uh, sport can actually contribute to the work of anti-racism? Yeah, look, I think there's different levels um, of sport. Obviously, I came up through grassroots, came through the community 
chain and, and worked my up, uh, my way up to um, professional sport. And I think there's definitely issues that resonate in both of those spaces. I don't think just because you're in community level and you go into professional sport, it stops racism there. I think it's kind of bled throughout sport, no matter the code level, standard, whatever it is. Um, I think it's something that Karen um, mentioned was that there's not enough evidence-based information. And I think um, one of the things is we need more accessible options and pathways for people to be able to report racism. Um, we only really have um, some government forms that we can fill out and they don't really offer much support for victims. I think there was 12 reports uh, last year in total for the whole year. Um, and I think it's a matter of being out of sight, out of mind in terms of you know, if, if we don't have the information to deal with, then we don't need to deal with it. And I think that's a major issue in terms of people not knowing how they deal with racism. First of all, right there and then when they experience it or they overhear it or oversee it. Um, but I think then to escalate it so then the victim does feel supported at that community level, at that grassroots game, at the professional game level, whatever it may be. Um, I know you mentioned in the intro, I'm doing some work with Reflect Forward. Um, which is um, a program uh, basically going into schools uh, and, you know, I guess starting the conversation and the, the discussions and the topics uh, around uh, anti-racism and that it's not on no matter where you are and uh, Reflect Forward are working on an app um, to allow communities to report racism anonymously um, so they feel comfortable to do that um, and then Reflect Forward will then, their job is to triage to um, their incidences to relevant departments such as Human Rights and, and the Australian Sports Commission. So um, there's definitely tools involved but I think ultimately there needs to be support and frameworks around people who experience racism um, and then the right means of how to report it and escalate it so then we can stand it out. I'm just mindful of the time. Um, so I might actually get um, Ellen, can I just get a final, I'll go around the, the, the panel, but um, can I get a final thought? Um, Ellen, if, if you've got something to share. Yeah, I'm sorry, just uh, Kaya, is that app that you mentioned, was that based on the, the UK app? There's an app in the UK that... They that... might be modelling it um, off that. Yeah, they're just in the process of, of developing it at the moment. Um, but, yeah, it'll be modelled because they have the same um, or somewhat similar program in the UK as well. Yeah, cool. All right, great. Yeah, um, no further comment. Just uh, just very honoured to be part of this, this panel and this discussion. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ellen. Um, I, I might take it to uh, Karen. Do you have any final thoughts? Um, I, it was a fabulous oration, Ellen. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed enjoyed it. And I think it's a really important discussion. I think now is the time, if not now, then when? Now is the time to actually get serious about tackling racism in sport. I hope that the people who are attending um, will listen to the call to action and, and think about how they can contribute. How about yourself, Melina? Uh, you're, on mute. you're on mute, Melina. I'm sorry about that. Um, I think um, everything that everyone else has said, really, I resonate with that. I would also say the result of the voice referendum makes it even more important that we increase our efforts as a matter of urgency to address issues of race, marginalization, of indigenous people and people of color and confront our colonial past. So, and that's in sport as well. Thank you. And Kaya, final thoughts? Yeah, um, no further comments from me, but I obviously just want to say it was an honor to be on the panel with you lovely ladies and you, Laurie. Um, I think this is such an important uh, topic and also some something that's so close to my heart and I'm passionate about and hopefully um, we can all kind of bring our brains together and um, make for positive change. Um, and I myself will hold myself accountable to make sure I'm doing as much as I can uh, you know, on the ground and also in the sporting landscape as a as a current Matilda. And um, thank you, everyone, also for your support in the most recent World Cup. Um, the journey continues, so stay with us. Thank you, Kai. And yes, definitely. And good luck with uh, what what's next with the Olympic qualifiers. And hopefully, you have a speedy recovery as well. Um, I think today 
you know, we heard from the ambassador talk about respecting each other. President Roz called, uh, put out a call to action and a chance to innovate on solutions to tackle racism in sport. And, you know, we heard about the power of conversation and that's what we did today. We started listening and talking to each other about where to from here. So thank you all for joining us today. It's been a great lecture um, and a great oration by Ellen Van Nieven. Um, great experience, uh, sorry, the great uh, comments and uh, insightful uh, discussion there on uh, by our panelists. Um, and it was a great opportunity to talk about the systemic change and what anti-racist reform there can be in Australia. So just, a reminder that the recording of this year's Kep Enderby Memorial Lecture will be uploaded to the Commission's YouTube channel and that's available in the coming days. Today's panel topic and other priority issues for progressing anti-racism in Australia will be encapsulated within Australia's inaugural National Anti-Racism Framework, the project the Commission is currently progressing. Finally, I'd like to thank uh, this opportunity to invite you to attend the Commission's upcoming Human Rights Awards Ceremony. That's on December the 8th. The awards are an annual celebration of human rights achievements. We invite you to join us in acknowledging, congratulating and sharing the important work of individuals and organisations who are making valuable contributions to advancing human rights in Australia. So if you're in, so if you're in Sydney, we'd love for you to join us at the UTS Great Hall on Friday, December the 8th. Um, for those who aren't able to make it in person, the event will also be live streamed. Once again, thank you very much to our panelists and to, uh, to Kai Simon, Karen Farkerson, Melina Stana and Ellen Van Nieven. Uh, to all our guests today, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you can find all the details on, our, on the Australian Human Rights Commission website. Thanks again for joining us today. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.